Hello and uh, welcome to Quinescast, Scotland's feminist arts podcast. My name is Hannah Lavery. And I am Caitlin Skinner. Quinescast is a space for us all to explore some big questions, themes and ideas together. To really listen to each other. Imagine that. (laughs) Each episode, we invite some of Scotland's leading feminist writers, poets, playwrights and musicians to respond to the big questions that matter to women, non-binary people and people of other marginalised genders in Scotland today. Quines, if you didn't know, is a Scottish word for women and girls and it comes from the theatre company Stellar Quines who are bringing you this podcast in association with the Traverse Theatre, Edinburgh International Book Festival and Jupiter Artland. Stellar Quines is an intersectional feminist theatre company based in Edinburgh. And this is the first ever episode of Quinescast. So welcome. Here we are recording from the Traverse Theatre. Yeah, so we are really excited to I suppose, welcome you in and come curry in. I hope you are sitting comfortably and maybe we should say a little bit about how this podcast came to be. Pandemic, Caitlin came out to visit me in Dunbar and we went for this lovely walk on Bellhaven Beach. I suppose both of us were sort of hungry for conversation and, and hungry for conversation around ideas and and about and about the world we were living in and it felt really isolating and lonely I think because there were so many big things happening there were so many it felt we were on the edge of all these these huge historical moments we didn't within our own lives have space to talk about them with our especially with our female friends mm. there was that desire to create a space for those conversations on one level and, and another I think at least I felt that I'd kind of lived my life in this country where when we'd have these big state of the nation moments, whether that's in theatre or whether that's, um, you know, politically, women's voices and women's experience do not seem to be central to those. So I felt like together with Stella Quines and, and the two of us, we could work towards creating that space. And this podcast is in a, a sense a realisation of that. Absolutely. And I think you and I have had many of those conversations where we've sat and put the world to rights and talked about those things that make us angry and frustrated and inspired and hopeful about the future and how we would sort it all out and that's felt such um, an important thing to be doing in this time in the time of change in the time of political upheaval and it turns out we have a lot of questions about who we are and who we want to be as a society but I suppose with all of that in mind for us this podcast is also a space of real coming together in a respectful way where people are listened and heard and I think it's really exciting that our first podcast we're going to give you today we recorded at the Edinburgh International Book Festival and there's something so exciting about literary festivals or any festival really but particularly the Edinburgh Book Festival I think because there is this space for ideas and there's a space for conversation and a model I think about how we talk about difficult things and and how we talk to each other and it felt to bring Quine's cast our first this this idea that we'd been kind of nurturing together to this space yeah it just felt right yeah, it was a really magical evening and a kind of conversation we desired and creating the podcast gave us an opportunity to invite some really brilliant, talented artists and thinkers into one space to respond to a theme. But you don't really know if it's what people want or what people need in the same way that you feel like it is. And there was just something about that night. It really felt like the audience really wanted it, really needed it. And it was quite emotional, actually. I suppose this was the, the, the night where we really tested the idea Absolutely. and it felt like that our desire was a lot of other people's desire as well. And I think when you resonate like that with people, I think it's really exciting. And I feel like it's probably a a time for us to start introducing and talking about it. We chose the theme city. Mm -hmm. Each of the podcasts that we're going to, we're going to bring to you are on a different theme, but the theme is deliberately chosen to be, um, I suppose, quite wide so that people can come to it any way they want to. And that was really important not to sort of dictate what the conversation will be or what, where people will take this. So we took City. And for me, City felt really important because we'd been, I think, as we were talking about building back better and coming back into the world, there was a lot of conversations. You know, I felt there was a lot of conversations or there was a lot of need for conversation about how we as women occupy city and space and and what a feminist city would look like and how we're safe in a city. You were also thinking about things around like the 20 mile what was that? Oh, 20 minutes neighbourhoods where in order to achieve uh, our goals for to 
combat the climate crisis, everyone would need to live in a, in a neighbourhood where they had basically access to all sorts of things within 20 minutes. So access to services, access to culture, access to school, all that kind of thing. So you don't have to travel. Uh, yeah, I was really interested in that idea and how that might change our relationship to, to living. Uh, yeah, that was a really interesting proposition for me. Yeah. And I think what you'll find as we as, as you hear our guests in our discussion group is the way they've come at it. And it's always surprising. Mm. Let's begin. Caitlin, would you let everyone know the lineup that we have for our first podcast? Yes. So for our first episode, responding to the theme of city, we have invited musician and storyteller Kareem Polwart, author Denise Miner, writer and author Chitra Ramaswamy, and a short play from playwright Sarah Shah. So let's take you back to the Edinburgh International Book Festival and to our first guest of the evening, Corinne. I moved to the city of Edinburgh 25 years ago. I don't, I don't live here anymore, but I moved here 25 years ago to take up a job with Scottish Women's Aid. And before that, I had worked um, as a children's worker in refuge in Glasgow and also as a volunteer at Dundee Women's Aid. So my experience of being in all three of those cities, Dundee, then Glasgow, then Edinburgh, was as cities, as sanctuaries whether it's the kind of sanctuary that you can get just by moving from one side of Glasgow to another side, or the kind of invisibility and anonymity that the city can afford you if you come from a small town or a, a kind of rural area, which is more my natural habitat. It's the kind of the indifference of cities, I suppose that's what I'm saying. It can be a blessing. But they can also be places of isolation and vulnerability for the very same reasons that they can be places of safety. And that's one of the questions that I have in my head this evening around what cities are and who they work for and who they don't work for. So I was fishing for a song that kind of spoke to those themes. And this song, strictly speaking, isn't really about them, but there's something about the imagery of it and the feeling of it that captures kind of what I want to, the ambivalence maybe of what I want to say. And it's one of my favourite songs, which is always a, a slightly um, trepidatious endeavour. Um, it's by Imogen Heap. It's called Hide and Seek. Where are we? And what the hell is going on? The dust has only just begun to form crop circles in the carpet sinking feeling spin me round again and rub my eyes this can't be happening when busy streets a mess with people would stop to hold their heads heavy hide and seek trains and sewing machines They were 
what you say. You said you only mean well. Of course you do.、Mm, what you say? You say it's all for the best. Of course it is.、Mm, what you say? You say it's just what we need. You decided this.、Mm, what you say? Sweet talk, newspaper word cut out. Speak no feeling, no. I don't believe it. You don't care a bit. You don't care a bit. Ransom notes keep falling from your mouth. Mid sweet talk, newspaper word cut out. Speak no feeling, no. I don't believe it. You don't care a bit. You don't care a bit. What an incredible artist Karina is, and what a wonderful opening to the night. What I find really interesting listening to, back to that is how much what she said about who gets to occupy a city and who is safe within that, who has agency within that, was such a, a recurring theme through the whole night. Yeah, and that song that she has chosen. Which was "Hide and Seek" by Imogen Heap. It's, it's amazing how well that that song actually conjures those images, and yeah, really sets the tone for a lot of the themes and ideas that runs throughout all the other pieces as well. So、um, let's introduce our next guest, who is the brilliant author, fashion icon, generally brilliant crime writer Denise Miner, and she has written us a provocation piece. Uh, for us, we wanted a, each episode will have a provocation piece, which is when we invite someone to write something that. Gets us thinking, gets us going, gets us started on the theme. So here is Denise and her provocation piece about city. To save you wondering halfway through, all of this is true, and I'm sorry if you have a 14 year old daughter, but it is a bit terrifying.、Um, it's called that time I forgot I was a woman. For 12 years, I had longed to go to New York and visit Mama. I wanted to see Picasso's painting, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. I wanted to stand face to face with it, to see it as all those painters had seen it in the studio, not an image in a book or a postcard reproduction. And I wanted to go by myself. I've always loved to travel alone. At fourteen, at school in South London, I'd get up at five a.m. some Saturdays and buy a ticket from Bromley South to Cali. Thirteen pounds fifty, same day return. Fairy included, because alone means seeing, not being seen. The subject sees, the object is seen. The object is passively perceived, framed by the eye of the active subject. But alone, I am the subject, not the object. But it's not safe for women to travel alone to cities. Alone is a gendered luxury. And I know New York is populated entirely by murderers and maniac cops, <laughs> so I decide not to speak to anyone all week. We land. Out of the airplane window, I see a man in a high vis vest guiding the plane to its gate with what looks like tennis bats. Wow, I think that man actually lives in New York, in America. <laughs> He lives here. Wow. This is the level of critique I applied to almost everything that week. <laughs> <laughs> And I won't go into detail because it makes me sound stupid. <laughs> But here are some of the snapshots of things I saw: 
a very tall, waspy man loudly ordering food in fluent Japanese as his Japanese girlfriend turns away and rolls her eyes. <laughs> hey, Mr. Z, said the doorman at the Paramount Hotel, an American. He said it to an old man who lived there. Mr. Z inspired genuine affection in the staff. A man watching Michael Moore f filming a piece to camera in Times Square and wiping his trousers, his hands on his trousers, over and over and over and over. <laughs> a small girl skipping with her mother and singing, we're going to the angel store. <laughs> Nobody else saw these things. In the New York Public Library, I go through microfilm and I find my great-grandfather's death certificate. James McGerty died in New York in 1929, a month before the Wall Street crash. He worked the boats, McGerty. He came back to Glasgow and he found his wife Catherine lying drunk in Springburn. He stole their two wee girls away. He sent Rose back to the family in Ireland and my grand Bessie to the John Street Orphanage in Glasgow. Catherine McGerty only found Bessie again decades later. Bessie was ashamed of her mother. She often kept her at the door or gave her money to go away. Or else Catherine came to the door for money. We'll never know. She was a bad and shameful woman. She was not spoken of. I go to the tenement where McGerty died. In the diner downstairs, I bore an Irish waitress with part of the story, but I stop out of compassion. I have never, nor I suspect ever will, meet anyone as hungover as that waitress was that day. <laughs> I go to Mama. I stand in front of the Damoiselle d'Avignon. It's a mad painting. Picasso did it and he kept it in his studio for 20 years. It's a sex pistols of a painting, i.e. it's not very good in and of itself. <laughs> but it presented a new way of seeing things. It kicked off cubism and it changed art from a purely representational form to something new, something exploratory and wild and baffling. In it, naked women with mask-like faces stand and they look out at us, the viewer, like that, defiant. Many years later, I will come and see this painting again with my son and I'll say to him, see that painting? That means an awful lot to me. I really love it. Let me take a picture of you in front of it. <laughs> and he, sensing my excitement and wanting to please me, will turn and raise his tiny hands in appreciation and bomb towards the Damoiselle d'Avignon and be rugby tackled by a guard. <laughs> <coughs> but alone in the city, I forget myself. On the plane coming back, I know I'm changed. I've barely spoken for a week. I have stopped feeling seen. I just am. The plane lands in Glasgow. As we get up and file out, a very drunk woman in front of me struggles to get her bag down from the overhead compartment. She announces to the plane, could some kind young man please help me? And I step forward and reach up and I lift out for her. <coughs> People look at me askance. I forgot I was a woman and I can't lift things. <laughs> for a woman to step up after a man was asked for is a statement. No one likes this. But I'm now holding the silky duffel bag above my head and I think to lighten the mood I make a sort of Hulk smash noise but I haven't spoken for a week and I misjudged the volume. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of go, whoa! <laughs> the drunk woman falls back in her chair. People startle away from me. All the way down the aisle a steward looks down. They're really concerned. They don't know what's going on. And suddenly I'm being looked at and judged. The bag is halfway down, but I get so embarrassed I lose my grip and the bag slithers away from me and drops to the floor and I hear bottles break inside. The high tang of liberated duty-free vodka wafts up at me. Everyone's looking, everyone's annoyed, and everyone thinks I've done something wrong and awful. And then I think, fuck it. <laughs> And I step over the bag of bottles that I broke with my feminist nonsense and I just swagger off the plane. <laughs> yeah, fuck it. <laughs> because I am the subject all day, every day. I'm all kinds of wrong, but I am the subject of this story. Thank Ooh. you. Yeah.
Oh, I just love that story. It's so good to listen back. So many moments that you just want to write down, like um, alone is a gendered luxury. Alone, I am the subject. Alone means seeing. There's so much wisdom, but it was just so funny. I am really struck by how deviant and like defiant it it means for her to be exploring a city on her own and Mm -hmm. in a non-apologetic way and and yeah, like you, you forget how cities are those places to be both anonymous and vulnerable, exactly as Corinne said right at the beginning, for women and people of other marginalised genders. Like it's not your space all the time. You have to own it. And, and also just how acutely aware we are of being object, of being seen, which I, I suppose I knew, but really she really forced me to reflect upon that. Yeah. That actually there's the, the, that kind of, and yeah, that alone is a gendered thing, that, that being anonymous is a gendered thing. Um, as well as um, being able to sort of explore cities. I think this is a really good moment for us to talk about our next part of, or one of the most important parts, I suppose, of of our podcast, or one of the most important um, elements, which is our discussion group. When we were bringing this and having this idea about this podcast, what we what we really wanted to do was to bring in different voices, because I think what we felt as both of us working in the arts is that we You know, sometimes that feels a bit of an echo chamber. And actually, we were really hungry for voices from other sectors, from from women that come in with different wisdoms, different viewpoints, different perspectives, maybe like that Picasso, all these different perspectives. And so we invited a group of women together from from the law, from academia, from activists, um, doctors, social workers, and we brought them together to respond and to discuss to listen to each other maybe you could tell us who is in that group yeah Yeah. absolutely so the group are lisa george talit Jacob, aman apol clementine burley carrie lunin and b asha their conversation was beautifully captured by our editor helena rifai and throughout this podcast for each of our contributors you'll hear a little clip from their discussion also around the theme of city yeah like a little palate cleanser in between so uh here's our first clip from our discussion group COVID-19 has been used as an excuse not to put the money in, even the little bit, the too little that existed before, to even claw that back. And that, again, is one of the ways in which, right, you can't, that's not a feminist city. That's not an inclusive city. Those are not inclusive decisions that are being made, particularly when it comes to feminism, because who takes on the burden of that care? Vast, vast majority are women. A vast majority of those who are unpaid carers are women. So when the city doesn't invest, actually disproportionately means that women are the ones that have to pick up the slack of what the city isn't doing. So I think it would feel different. I think instead of being largely horizontal, it would be vertical. Um, It would have more curves rather than more edges. It would have more spaces for people to come together and meet and and it would have more spaces for children. Um, It would have more green um, and it would feel safer to walk around in. So some of it would be logistics, so there would be free public transport, it would be safe to get home at night, it would be well lit. Um, But I think it just, it feels like it would have a different um, ambience around it than a a masculine city would, probably have less traffic, less noise, um, but definitely more spaces for people to come together and collaborate and be creative. I think it would have um, universal basic income. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that this is the foundation on which most of people's uh, deprivation is based, is not being able to support themselves without ending up completely exhausted, Um, so exhausted at the end of the day that they have no resources after work to do anything at all. So, the you know, I I picked up a little bit on something you said about uh, cities being safe in the sense that um, people being able to get home safely. Well, for most women, um, home is the most unsafe place yeah. that there is. And yeah. if they, I really believe, yeah. as women have become more financially independent, mm. they have been staying for much shorter periods in families that abuse and exploit mm-hmm. them, whether those are their families of birth or the families which they happen to form because they have a relationship. So I think people are being kept deliberately short of money in order to make them into an unpaid and deprived um, resource for other people to have cheap services from. Because you couldn't have a coffee for £3 in the centre of um, Edinburgh 
unless the person that was serving you that coffee was not being paid a proper wage for what they were um, for what they were doing. I'm just thinking about how, <clears throat> like in my life, what I would be a feminist city to be, and this might be really daft, but the first thing I thought of was when there were so many girls being spiked in nightclubs. Yeah. And it had evolved. It was as if during COVID, the people that were doing this had went away and thought, right, how do we do this better? How do we spike people in a more efficient way where we don't need to touch our drinks? And we can, you know, and then it was the the, the Jags. Yeah. And I thought that was around Halloween time. And I remember because it was like my first night out after COVID. And I was looking at the way that the clubs were responding, clubs in the city. And I thought, oh, you know, they're going to shut they're going to shut and they're going to think, oh, they don't want any of the girls in their clubs to be to be spiked. And life continued mm-hmm. and nothing really stopped. Mm-hmm. And you're just sitting in the little town of Renfrew looking at the city thinking, what on earth? Like, this is a crisis. This is a huge danger to young women or young men or whoever was being spiked. Whoever it was, it was a problem and it was a danger and it was predominantly young women that were being affected. Mm-hmm. And then God knows else, I dread to think what else is happening to them after they'd been spiked and would a feminist city have continued absolutely not no and what's really what a feminist city wouldn't do is after that put the emphasis on the victim so you just said if at the end of that oh Sorry. it was do you know what i found so incredible about these discussion groups i mean obviously we'd chosen that clip from a much longer discussion and so we had to know we had a sense of of the power of it but listening to it again in the context with the audience as well and just i think especially that idea about this wouldn't happen in a feminist city the things that we'd, we would accept and wouldn't accept and the idea of of who has agency was just so powerful to me. And I think what I found incredible about this discussion group, and we talked, I think there's a reason why we had this discussion group from, and we brought this group together from women from such a diverse range of backgrounds and, and, and different fields was that I think sometimes, you know, you and I are so sort of, we're so part of, you know, you know very much we live within the arts community, I suppose. And so that is something really exciting about having those different viewpoints and different perspectives in. And I think it's something that we don't create enough time for. So yeah, just oops. And yeah, Glasgow has has just announced that it's going to be the UK's first feminist city. It's going to be taking a feminist approach to town planning. So yeah, it'd be interesting to kind of hold that to account and think, okay, like you mean that? Let's Absolutely. let's really look at what that means. Yeah, so who can... gets who gets to be part of these yeah. discussions as well? Yeah. So for every Quine's cast, we invite a playwright to create a short play inspired by our theme. For City, our writer has been the brilliant Sara Sharawi. Sara is an Egyptian-born writer based in Glasgow, uh, and I've had the pleasure this year of directing her play Sister Radio, which has been out on tour around Scotland for Stellar Quines. Um, but the play we have today is called A Tourist, and it's performed by Emily Patry, Helen Katamba, and Natalie Toyne. And this will be followed by another clip from our group discussion. The air smells different. Nah, it's the same. No, it's definitely different. What's wrong with her? I'm telling you, it's the air. Will you stop? She can't find it. What? She can't find the place. Must be around here somewhere. Maybe it's shut. No. Maybe. But but it's the place. Her place. It's just a place. It's her milestones. It's where she went on dates and fell in love. Mm. (laughs) Where she went on dates and got dumped. Mm. Where she... uh, Celebrated birthdays. Uh, graduations. Had leaving dues. And arrival drinks. <laughs> it can't have shut. Someone would have told her. They don't live in the city anymore. Who? Well, they live in the suburbs now. It's all changed. She left. This is what happens when you leave. You can't just hit pause on a city and expect it to just wait. Be there all the time. And timeless. She can't find this place. Her place. Not hers anymore, though, is it? What are you talking about? This place will always be hers. No, if it doesn't exist anymore. She will find it. How long has she been away? It doesn't matter. Everything changes. She's changed. That's why she can't find it. She doesn't remember the city anymore. It's not in her bones anymore. Well, it's it's not completely alien, though, is it? She recognises it, this city that building (laughs) this street that massive sign (laughs) those smiles and the sounds those sounds trapped in her throat cutting cutting 
into her throat. That familiar feeling. Mm. Yeah. The air. The air thick. No, 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 the air is different. Is it though? Maybe it's her. She's different. The air in her lungs feels different. Maybe it's her. With her new lungs. With her new tongue. A new hair. Maybe. Maybe it is her. Awkwardly moving through space. Struggling to find the right words. Trying to picture herself in her stories as she told them over and over. Trying to picture herself in this place. This place that doesn't seem to exist anymore. This place that is undermining her grip on her identity and who she is. This place that makes her feel like she belongs. She's local, don't worry. This place that holds her youth. The place she thought that never would change. This place. Maybe the city doesn't recognise her anymore. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, Maybe the city has grown and grown in another direction. Uh-huh. Oh, uh, yeah. Maybe the city needed a break. Maybe. Uh, mm. Maybe it's time for me to move. What? No. I only hurt her. Uh, we are her memories. We keep her connected. We are delusional. You're being Aww. ridiculous. Maybe I'm no memory at all. Maybe I'm just a fantasy. A, a false sense of belonging, an imagined state of being. She'll be happier if I weren't what? here. And how can she grow if she I am... She found it! Oh, thank you. <laughs> Place. Looks uh, different. Doesn't it? I think there was one of the interesting things about the pandemic, people wearing masks, meant that if you didn't feel like that, you you know, you weren't... Because I think it did affect all of our confidence mm -hmm. and social confidence because you just got kind of de-skilled at it. You know, you're kind of walking around and hidden and feeling anxious and standing apart from people. Mm -hmm. And then when people started to take masks off, suddenly you felt really vulnerable because it's like people... You're walking down the street and people will recognise you, whereas if you've only got your eyes showing, people maybe don't so much. Rec or, you know, they don't clock you. And sometimes that was quite nice as well when you were not feeling like it. Yeah. The thing also that I noticed actually is, um, for me, um, cities have been about being, um, blending in. Because I think that I stick out in the countryside. When I go out to the West Coast, I'm always the only black person that is there. And so um, I lose my anonymity completely. If anything happens in that space, everybody knows um, who was there when that happened. And everybody else is anonymous to me, you know. And so I think when I'm in cities, when I've been in big cities, I've never, ever been the only black person in that city. I think you make a really good point about who is othered. You know, um, particularly in rural Scotland, particularly in the small towns, um, I've been in places where even if, even if you're just visiting, you're there as a kind of woman of colour and it's like, you know, heads turn. It's like we we know that you're not from here, but we also know you in particular are not from here. So I think that's part of the anonymity that's like within cities. And I want, sometimes wonder if that's why you have, you know, there's a whole host of things like, uh, you know, um, ac access of jobs, um, access of um, services and whatever in within city landscapes but you also have more diverse populations within cities and I do often feel that it actually would be quite hard to be from communities of colour and in rural spaces where you are potentially the only family of colour that is in that space and I just think the way that that even even if it's not intended the spotlight that puts on you I think is really must be really really difficult to deal with. Yeah, that's really interesting. My dad was my dad was born in Huddersfield and then he moved to Scotland when he was about 16, but he moved to the neighborhood that we're still in now mm -hmm. and that was the first Asian family to move into that neighborhood or, or that part of the town and I think he basically scoped Renfrew out for us and I think he grew up realizing okay, this is quite a racist space like and that's really informed where we went to school or 
the areas that we would spend time in. It's obviously gotten better over time, but for him, I do just sit and think, wow, that must have been really challenging to have been the first Asian family Mm -hmm. in this area. I think that was to the discussion and the play and this idea of belonging, about cities being ever-changing places, but also the sites of memory, I found really powerful. And I think especially that last discussion group, that, you know, it's, it, you know, the idea of being, especially I think when you're from a minority or a you know, person of colour, that cities are a place of sanctuary. I just found those insights in that discussion group and that, those moments just really powerful. And I think that's just what we really wanted was that sharing of people's truths. And, and I think that the piece that we're going to listen to now by um, Chicha Ramaswamy um, from her absolutely sensational book, Homelands, she reads about a place within Glasgow that was sanctuary, a place to, for people to come together and hold culture and hold belonging. And I think that we often forget when we think about cities that for many people it's a place that actually offers safety. I'm really pleased that Chitra came along to read this because it feels like it's just the this piece that she chose just is absolutely perfect. I'm going to read from a chapter of the book called It All Goes Back to the House on the Hill. The House on the Hill is at 358 Socky Hall Street. It is simple in style, a child's drawing come to life with a pitched roof, five large windows, and a portico held aloft by slender columns. It stands back from the street, perched in another era, at the top of the steep slope that gives it its nickname, enclosed in its its own landscaped garden, hemmed in by younger tenement cousins. It's arrived at by a long flight of stairs that ascend at a slant from one of the most famous thoroughfares in Glasgow. Here, for now is the place where Henry and Ingrid meet during the wartime summer of 1941. It was a very powerful youth club, says Henry. Its members, I think there are around 60 of us, were from Austria, Czechoslovakia and Germany, though not all Jewish. The people there were a few years older than we were. We learned a lot from them. It was our first contact with music and art, One of the chaps was a chorus master, and we sang Mozart. It was a most interesting way to find out what being young is all about. Henry, Ingrid protests, it wasn't my first contact with music. I've always loved music. Yes, says Henry, but it all goes back to the house on the hill. He turns to his wife. You tell the story, Ingrid, about the sandwiches. The sandwiches were put in the middle, says Ingrid, looking intently at Henry. Why, Henry prompts her, because we wanted everyone to have the same. You weren't allowed to eat your own, Henry explains. You put them in the middle and it was a lucky dip. They were Marxist sandwiches. That's right, Henry laughs. That's how it was. At the refugee centre, there is a library, theatre group, meeting rooms, and a canteen famous for its proper coffee and cheap meals cooked by Austrian chefs. Soup, rye bread, liver sausage. The continental cuisine becomes locally renowned and students begin to drift over from the art school for a bowl of soup. When Henry enters the house on the hill, he steps inside a world that to the rest of the city is foreign, but to him is home. A home, moreover, that does not reject, persecute, and seek to obliterate him. A home that no longer exists for him in Germany and never will again, but is somehow here in a shabby Georgian mansion, and here for once assimilation is not the ultimate aim of every interaction. Here Henry can be free, amongst his own, He can speak German, sing German songs, talk about his internment, eat the food of his childhood, stay up late discussing what might become of Europe, share news of the war, listen to young men and women talk about returning to rebuild their countries after it's all over, make friends for life, fall in love. The house on the hill is the centre of their world. Chess, Music, philosophy, medicine, literature, politics, war, 
anti-Semitism, home. Everything is up for discussion under the probably leaking roof of 358 Socky Hall Street. And it's here that Henry is politicized. And it is this proud history of activism that will threaten Henry and Ingrid's application for naturalization in the near future. A history that for the refugees is a matter of moral and political obligation, both to homeland and host country during the war. This place they call home where they meet, fall in love and together become themselves will in a few short years be viewed as a cause for suspicion, a sinister place, a potential risk to their British citizenship. Do not join any political organization or take part in any political activities, advises a booklet issued by the Jewish Board of Deputies and the German Jewish Aid Committee. This is what it is to be a refugee in wartime Britain. This is how fraught with danger belonging can be. Daddy did say I shouldn't go there, says Ingrid. Your father didn't like it, Henry agrees. He said you're too political, you march on May Day, you're too left wing. It could get you into trouble. Well, he was right, we now see. It just shows you that whatever you do, somebody is watching you. By 1946, the war is over and the refugee centre is dissolving. The last Georgian villa on Socky Hall Street will, be not, will not be here for much longer. In a couple of decades, the house on the hill will be demolished to make way for an extension to Glasgow's dental hospital. By the time I arrive in the city, you would never have known it was there. During my student years, when I'm the same age as Henry was at the house on the hill, I will also spend most of my recreational life on Socky Hall Street, the party street of Scotland's party capital, as it's now become. This is where I will go drinking at the weekends, filling my belly with greasy noodles before the long stagger home in the dark, picking my way past the piles of vomit and abandoned polystyrene trays lining the street. This is where I will go clubbing, see bands, art exhibitions, and watch films in a newly refurbished gallery a few doors down from the dental hospital. This is one of the places where I will fall in love with a woman for the first and only time in my life. The woman with whom I will go on to have children and share this precious life. For a few charmed years, this gallery will be a beacon for people like me. The place where my new love and I will sit, cloaked in the dark of a tiny cinema nestled in the building watching a double bill of films, Richard Linklater's Before Sunrise and Before Sunset, that in another 15 years will influence these words I'm writing right now. This bold reset of Alexander Greek Thompson's Grecian chambers, all millennially spirited steel and glass, light and exposed sandstone, will be my very own house on the hill. At the time, I'm oblivious to my surroundings. This is what it is to be young, carefree, not yet rebuilt by the passing of time. Living out your life inside its most present part, in the spacious rooms of youth, guarantees that you cannot appreciate it. So nor do I know this. But when the refurbishment of the gallery begins and decades of plasterwork and false ceilings are removed, layer by layer, day after day, a ghost from another time emerges, a lost Georgian villa of Socky Hall Street, towering 15 feet high on iron stilts in the midst of the Grecian chambers, part of the same terrace as the house on the hill, entombed in the street for more than 140 years. Thank you. A good life is one where things are created with the people furthest away in mind. And then it catches everybody else. It was so way. interesting during the pandemic, because working as a social worker at that point, there were all these pockets of money that were suddenly available to us. We could apply to loads of different funds for our families. And actually, their circumstances hadn't really changed. Like, they mostly weren't earning any less money because a lot of them were living on benefits or very low incomes anyway. And But I just applied for everything anyway because it was so nice. But, I, you know, and it was so... But you just have to question if all this money can be available during a time like that, why... why? If you can... Is it, 
pure uh-huh. homelessness in a night. Suddenly, like all the homeless people in the UK are like, they've got a place to stay for a night. Like if you can do that, just like that, but you've been saying, oh, the, the money isn't there. Asylum for seekers in detention like, centres all released. Oh, all released. Everyone's suddenly <laughs> safe and comfortable and okay. Like I, I think I've, I've, a friend who works as a, a psychologist and he's worked within homelessness for 20 years and he has always reflected, which I found really helpful, that, you know, for example, healthcare systems are designed by healthy people for use by healthy people. Yeah. And that is so true. It's really difficult for a lot of people to navigate the really complex systems that we've designed around health or education or social care or benefits or whatever it is. You have to have a certain level of literacy, confidence, agency, money, access to transport to be able to access any of that stuff. And there are huge pockets of people who just never, ever access it. So I think you're right. I think it's about how can we ensure that the people who are missing in all of this are the people that we design this service for and because everyone else will be able to make use of it regardless so you know kind of design it for the people that are most marginalized in mind that's it and if you do that that's i mean that's 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 intersectional design right that's intersectional feminism is thinking about those who are furthest away with compounding inequalities women who are in that space and then designing it from there because you will catch everybody else along the way forget that people like you are the ones that might be in need but actually design it with not just on behalf of with people who are furthest away and marginalized and have them included in the conversation That's it. it's, the it's ridiculous is of not having people that are experiencing these things in those conversations and it's just like the others who have never experienced that are the ones who decide it makes no sense to that if we can come in this room and have this conversation it's not a difficult one to have it comes really naturally they could do it Whoa. I love that you can really hear in that discussion group, you can really see, hear that they're getting into it. Like as a group, you can really hear the energy in that conversation, the passion, the back and forward. Yeah, it's really nice to hear. I remember listening to that on the night and just thinking about how it felt like we'd created our own house on the hill. Yeah. That idea where everyone finds belonging and community and their own voice. And this thing about designing and having everyone included in the conversation. And what I loved yeah. about that was that thing of, we can come together and talk about this. Why can't they? And what an inspirational way to kind of close the night in some ways. But, but actually, that isn't how we close the night. Exactly. And I'm so excited that this is the end of it. Like having listened to it all back and come to this end point, we're welcoming back uh, Kareem Powart for uh, a really special cover. And uh, I hope you can hear in the recording that the audience very much uh, are singing along with her. And I'm also hoping that wherever you are, you might have the opportunity to sing along as well. Yeah, I'm just imagining you all with your headphones on. Or but yeah, thank you so much, Annette, and and we'll and we'll um, we'll we'll bring back Corinne Powart. I met my sister on the weekend. She lives in Glasgow, and uh, for so she's five years younger than me. So she's in her uh, mid to late forties, and uh, <laughs> let's call it mid. Um, <laughs> for 25 years she worked in bars and restaurants so she was, she worked behind the bar she got up to being a duty manager in bars in Glasgow so, so she knows all about the kind of nether end of the day um, experience of uh, working in, in a city um, and then she kind of um, worked um, in 2020 when the, when the lockdown happened she was working in a, in a posh restaurant in Finiston in Glasgow and um, she was given furlough and came back in the autumn and she hated it so much, the experience of not having been at work um, after just a few weeks of being in a posh restaurant in Finiston and being patronised and exploited by the customers <laughs> in the restaurant, she quit. And she works now as a social carer in a supported housing project. So she's gone from one extreme of the day to another and um, has a very good awareness of, um, of hard work <laughs> in, in a city context. Anyway, being well acquainted with bars and how to navigate them um, for all of her adult life, what she does for crack now and um, is she goes to Manchester um, on the train <laughs> by herself. It, I loved um, Denise's story. <laughs> um, and my sister does that and, and she does it um, remarkably well and she goes and she drinks in old men's bars in Manchester and, and goes in and out of charity shops. And, um, and I think perhaps she has an air about her. She's kind of a, she's very tall and um, um, eccentrically dressed woman. Um, so she's perhaps not a threatening person to find beside you in a wee booth in an old men's bar in Manchester. 
anyway, it's got me thinking about my experiences of arriving in Edinburgh and bars and being in bars because I was never any good at be working in bars. I was, I was too shy and I was too, um, too busy, too, too, too fidgety for to be trusted with um, a tray of, of beer. Um, <laughs> um, but actually, one of the places well, I, I'm, a, I'm a folk singer, so my introduction to the city was these twin things of working for Women's Aid and discovering the, the world of Scottish traditional music and folk music through the bars of Edinburgh. And one in particular, which is a city institution, the Royal Oak on Infirmary Street. And, um, and I'm going to do a song connected with that because one of the things that was striking about that place... I'm, I'm now in my 50s and actually... I think I would probably be quite terrified to go into a bar on my own at this point in life. Apart from anything else, um, if you try to get a drink at a bar at the age of uh, at this age, um, you're invisible to the bartenders. Um, so it's a, it's a it's a complicated business just um, getting your getting your pint of lager in. Um, anyway, the Royal Oak. This is a long introduction for a short song. The Royal Oak. I would like to praise as a microcosm of of good city behaviour because the owners of the Royal Oak at the time were sisters, eh, Sandra and Dorothy, and they had been dancers in the White Heather Club in the 1960s and 70s, and they were incredible. Eh, well, actually, I, I say Dorothy was quite a, a, a mousy woman, but Sandra was absolutely the most incredible, extravagant, um, kind of copper-haired, made immaculate. She was an immaculate kind of just madam of the whole place. And what was beautiful about the Royal Oak was that um, it was a haven for kind of poor souls and people struggling and people on the margins were welcomed into the Royal Oak. And you could go into the Royal Oak on your own and almost everyone else would be in the Royal Oak on their own. And I went there as a, a woman in my mid-twenties, mid to late-twenties, um, and I felt safe in the Royal Oak. I, because actually, like Denise said, I felt like I was I had authorship of my evening and I found a sense of community in the bar of the of the of the Royal Oak. So I know there are horrendous experiences um, have come to light during lockdown of, of, of my younger peers in particular in the folk scene about their experiences of being out and about in bars um, and and that needs a, a light shone upon it. But I would just like to remember the Royal Oak and there's something in the spirit of singing together and welcoming waifs and strays, of which I was one at the time. So I'm going to do a wee song with a nod to Manchester with my sister in mind. Um, it's a song about, yeah, I guess just looking after each other. It's another cover. I'm all about the covers at the minute. Um, and it's, um, it's by James, who are a Manchester band. <laughs> and you can sing as long if you like as well. <laughs> Sing myself to sleep A song from the darkest hour Secrets I can keep Inside of a day A swing from high to deep Extremes of sweet and sour A hope that God exists I hope, I pray Drawn by the undertow, my life is out of control. I believe this wave will bear my weight, so let it flow. Oh, sit down, no, oh, sit down, no, oh, sit down, sit down next to me, sit down, 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 down in sympathy. Well, I'm relieved to hear You've been to some far out places It's hard to carry on When you feel all alone Now I've come back down again It's worse than it was before If I hadn't seen such riches I could live with being poor Sit down, no, oh, sit down, no, oh, sit down, sit down next to me. Sit down, 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 down in sympathy. Those who feel the 
breath of sadness sit down next to me and those who fear they're touched by madness sit down next to me and those who find themselves ridiculous sit down next to me in love in fear in hate in tears in love and fear in hate and tears in love and fear in hate and tears in love and fear and hate down 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 would you sing again sit down, oh sit down, oh sit down, sit down next to me, sit down, 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 in sympathy, oh sit down, oh sit down, oh sit down, sit down next to me, sit down, 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 in sympathy. Thank you for listening. We hoped you enjoyed our show. And if you did, please tell your pals. You can find us on all your favourite podcast platforms. If you're enjoying it, then please rate and review, which helps us to make more podcasts and also helps people find our show. Our second episode will be out next week and the theme is wild. Our guests include writer Dr Amanda Thompson, the sensational musician Catherine Joseph, performance poet Victoria McNulty and a new play from Rona Monroe. I hope you can join us then. Thank you so much for everyone who's been part of our first episode and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye. This episode of Coinscast was created and presented by Hannah Lavery and Caitlin Skinner. Editor Helena Rafai, project producer Barbie Lane. Performers in A Tourist by Sara Shorwi were Emily Patry, Helen Katamba and Natalie Toyne. Sound engineer Graham Godley. The Stellar Quines team are... General Manager, Barbie Lyon. Associate Director of Engagement, Beth Godfrey. Artistic Director and CEO, Caitlin Skinner. Company Administrator and Young Coins Producer, Erin McGee. Head of Audiences and Communications, Sarah Marie Mooney. Coinscast Image by Julia Francis Dugan. Coinscast is possible because of the funding from Creative Scotland and the support of our partners, the Travis Theatre, Edinburgh International Book Festival and Jupiter Rising at Jupiter Artland. We are stellar coins because of the many people who've supported us over the years. Next year, we'll see us reach our 30th year of asking for better representation and equality. And we still have a long way to go. We need your support and sponsorship to help us keep that work going. Please get in touch via stellarquines.co.uk if you can help support our future. If you want to keep up to date with all things Quines, please visit our website and sign up for the newsletter. <laughs>